as usual. And yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to Max Min. So now after uh, Yuri's talk, I will talk about a similar problem, but um, for even uh, simple objects in a sense. So atomic clouds uh, without uh, any uh, bonds between them. So for chemists, it might look a bit strange what we do not consider bonds, but the objects become simpler in, and this allows us to uh, prove actually stronger results uh, in this particular case. So what's, uh, what's the uh, key question here? Um, Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. So <clears throat> the key question what we are asking for molecules and later in uh, Dan's talk uh, for solid crystalline materials is same or different. And uh, this question uh, mathematically actually is rather non-trivial because many real data objects uh, is, are represented in a digital form. For example, as a list of coordinates or uh, in a crystallographic information file, um, similarly by uh, atomic coordinates in rather ambiguous ways. So that's why we need to clarify what uh, exactly we mean by saying. And uh, uh, this, uh, as a motivation, uh, usually I cite this paper with uh, the question in the title, same or different. It was uh, this particular paper is about uh, solid crystalline forms, so rather recent, but uh, uh, the same question, same or different, makes sense also for many other objects. So uh, in this audience, we uh, have some chemists, so a brief reminder that uh, we could consider many different equivalence relations on our objects. And uh, all of them uh, can be fine uh, if they satisfy three basic axioms reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And the transitivity action here is especially important because it guarantees that our classification under such an equivalence relation produces disjoint, uh, disjoint classes, so no, no confusions. If uh, two classes uh, overlap, um, so have uh, a common element B, so if A is equivalent to B and B is equivalent to C, then A and C should be also in the same class exactly by this transitivity action. And uh, we learn uh, this equivalence is actually even from primary school, so the usual equality relation is an equivalent because any number can be written down in many different numerical forms. So our uh, main equivalence, uh, we argue, is a rigid motion because if, if you have uh, an object here, indeed, such as a molecule, and we simply translate or rotate, then uh, the underlying structure remains the same. But if uh, the molecule is flexible, for example, a protein, or much more complicated than this one, if you have a flexible molecule, uh, then different rigid conformations of that flexible molecule might have different properties. So that's why it's important to distinguish uh, these rigid conformations uh, even for flexible molecules. So two different equivalence relations. So rigid motion and a slightly weaker isometry, which uh, also include reflections, right? But we will uh, consider in parallel. Both of, both of them, they differ here uh, only by um, including reflections or not. So uh, as you have realized, uh, especially from uh, our uh, previous days um, at Max Min, we consider well, different types of objects. So yesterday we talked about protein back backbones that uh, consist of ordered atoms. And uh, usually uh, proteins are uh, considered very complicated um, objects, so in structural biology, thousands of atoms. However, I should say from a mathematical point of view, uh, proteins are simpler than general molecules. Why? Because atoms are ordered. So we have an order according to the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids, and this order gives us uh, a, a lot of opportunities to construct very easy invariants. And even the classical invariant, the distance matrix uh, on this order at points is, is, is simply complete. So 
up to isometry. So it doesn't distinguish mirror images, but uh, under isometry, the distance matrix on ordered points is a complete invariant. In the sense that we could reconstruct this ordered sequence from um, uh, from the matrix of all pairwise distances. And we learn uh, simple examples of that even from school. So if you have a triangle, say three ordered points, and you know three distances between these three points, one they determine the rigid triangle you need to. And similarly, if points are ordered, this works for any number of points. So uh, yesterday, uh, on Wednesday, we discussed strong results in this ordered case, so applied to proteins. Today, we talk about molecules, uh, so graphs in your stock, um, uh, but I will um, consider only atomic clouds without bonds, and uh, these clouds will consist of unordered points. So, uh, of course, uh, in, in molecules like that, uh, we can distinguish atoms. So, one oxygen, uh, two hydrogens were certainly different. However, many molecules, well, even, even this one, contain indistinguishable atoms. So, here we have two hydrogens. Okay, two is a simple number, but if you consider, um, for example, benzene molecule, so it has six carbons and six hydrogens, and if you now uh, allow all possible permutations, so it will be six factorial by six factorial, and this is actually uh, the product of this uh, factorial, so it's already half a million. So it's uh, it's a lot of permutations to, to consider. That's why there is no easy reduction to the case of order. Uh, order of molecules, and uh, as uh, Alexander uh, mentioned uh, earlier, the much harder case is when we have not single molecule, but uh, say molecular crystals, so an infinite uh, configuration, and this will be discussed um, later in the afternoon. So uh, it makes sense to consider only point sets because these are very simple inputs. So even actually QM9 database, which I also mentioned later, contains only uh, coordinates of atoms, but, but not even bonds. So they are not initially present in the database, but uh, of course there are some software programs that uh, reconstruct covalent bonds for uh, a given um, collection of atoms with three-dimensional coordinates. But nonetheless, it's an extra step. So the most basic input is uh, only a point cloud. And uh, yeah, it might look strange that <laughs> Uh, when when we look at a molecule, we take only three points even without bonds. Uh, but you will see later uh, why uh, we actually don't lose any information if you know precisely enough with atomic coordinates. And yes, in practice, if you take any point clouds, for example, when you say feature points or corner points from an image, so in computer vision and computer graphics, when uh, these points are usually not ordered especially if there are many of them. That's why this case of unordered points is um, more practical. Yes, uh, to distinguish objects under any equivalence relation, for example, under rigid motion, uh, we need to use invariants. So an invariant is a function from uh, our set of objects to some simple space of numbers, vectors, matrices, where it uh, would be easier to compare objects. And the definition of the invariant requires that uh, if our objects are equivalent, so for example, we have a molecule in one position and a rigidly equivalent molecule in a different position, so given by well, different uh, lists of atomic coordinates, then the invariant should map these two different representations into the same value. So I of A should be equal to I of B. A simple invariant for molecules is say the number of atoms right so in this position we have three atoms and any rigidly equivalent position also has three atoms so this is a of course a very simple invariant but nonetheless it's useful because if you have molecules consisting of different numbers of atoms then of course they cannot be rigidly equivalent they should be different and in the language of computer science uh, uh this invariant property uh, means that we have no false negatives at all. So a false negative is a pair of different representations uh, of um, equivalent objects. So we have equivalent objects, but uh, different representations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> the center of mass, as was previously discussed, is, is uh, an easy descriptor that could be computed, but it's not invariant because we can easily change it under translation or rotation. 
So you cannot use it for comparison. So the same, well, rigidly equivalent molecule can easily have many different centers of masses. So invariants uh, can be very different. They could be very big. For example, the size of a molecule, say, uh, the number of atoms, or they could be stronger. For example, chemical composition, if, if you allow uh, atomic types, then, of course, it is a much stronger invariant. Say, uh, the number of atoms does not distinguish with two molecules, right, three atoms involved. But chemical composition certainly does distinguish if you allow extra labels on these points. But uh, nonetheless, it, it is uh, also not uh, sufficient. And Yuri showed specific examples when we have stereo isomers. It means mm, uh, molecules with the same composition, but different geometric embeddings in the three-dimensional space. So that's why uh, we are looking for strong invariants that would distinguish uh, all, um, all rigidly uh, non-equivalent non -equivalent, uh, molecules. And uh, our problem here is, um, is very complicated because uh, imagine what happens if you slightly perturb, say, in simulations. We uh, simulate atomic positions, we have slight perturbation. When under slight perturbation, we get a different rigid class. Right? So maybe it's, it's easier to see here. So if you so squash the molecule, it will not be equivalent to the originally non perturbed molecule. Right? So it means that any small perturbation gives us a different class, and, and as a result, we have an infinitely continuous space of rigid conformation. So many classes and difficult to distinguish them. Nonetheless, uh, in mathematics, almost everything is possible. So we are looking for a complete invariant. Complete means what if an invariant i, so a function on molecules, takes the same value, then we should be rigidly equivalent. And informally speaking, it can be considered as analog of a DNA style code that, for example, identifies humans in uh, serious cases such as court trials. Yeah, as usual, feel free uh, to ask questions uh, during the talk. So why uh, do we consider, uh, invi why do you think that invariants are completely sufficient for, uh, for practical um, applications? So invariants, uh, by definition, they distinguish objects, while non-invariants don't. But of, of course, we need, uh, we need strong invariants, so we will be looking for complete and also quickly computable, so polynomial time computable invariants. But we also need uh, continuous invariants, because if we perturb our object slightly, we, well, we should expect that an invariant changes only continuously, also slightly, under small perturbation. Otherwise, we... Uh, otherwise, with, with discontinuity, if, if you have it, uh, simply uh, affects uh, any potential optimization of properties on, on that space of rigid conformations. Uh, there is a similar concept. Uh, some of you might have heard about equivariants. Um, so I don't give a formal definition, which is a bit technical, but the center of mass of a molecule is equivalent in the sense that when we translate the center of mass is affected in the same way. So the same translation is applied to the center of mass. So this uh, equivariant is a, a weaker concept. So it's uh, it's not uh, an arbitrary number assigned to our object, but uh, still it is weaker. And equivariants uh, are usually used um, to predict atomic forces in simulations that act on uh, atoms. Because if you again uh, translate or rotate a molecule, then uh, the um, force acting on an atom should should be affected by a linear operator in the same way, by the same translation or rotation. However, uh, so here we explain briefly, but we could actually use only invariants uh, for molecular simulations as well. Because what what's the aim? The aim is to perturb uh, atomic positions and get. Um, a better configuration of atoms, maybe with a low energy or maybe with uh, optimizing another property. So our interest is produced from one configuration of atoms, another configuration of atoms. And we could simply skip uh, this, um, this step, predicting every atomic force individually and look for the next configuration of atoms uh, in terms of a complete invariant. So if you have a, 
complete invariant describing our atomic cloud? Oh, a question. Uh, yes, Marjan, please. Marjan, you are. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, so, can you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so when you're considering uh, the motion of the uh, um, center of mass, um, do you consider only the atoms of one molecule or do you also consider the molecules around it? I mean, we, we can see the single molecule. So, a cloud of atoms from a single molecule only in this presentation. Uh, more complicated cases, such as molecular crystals, for example, will be discussed in the afternoon by, by Dan. Okay. So, it, it, it's, it, it's a really hard problem, but uh, here today, this morning, we focus on, on a single molecule. Thank you. How I answered your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Right. So now uh, we formally state the problem. So we would like to map rigid clouds to uh, a simple space. And uh, the difference with uh, the Tokyo theory, we do not consider uh, uh, edges of bonds. A pure atomic, a pure cloud of points, not other. But conditions are similar. So we would like to have completeness. And in the language of computer science, it means uh, no false negatives and no false positives at all. Lipschitz continuity, so it means that uh, we sh would like to have not only an invariant, but also a metric on this invariance. Uh, so metric D, uh, which is continuous in the strongest sense. So the classical so-called epsilon delta continuity in mathematics is much weaker. Lipschitz continuity means that if we perturb every atom up to epsilon, so shift um, every atom up to epsilon, then uh, the invariant of the new perturbed um, cloud changes in a suitable metric designed in advance up to a constant times epsilon. So this constant lambda times epsilon and the metric uh, we might should satisfy with um, three metric axioms and the triangle inequality is hopefully familiar to you from school geometry and I only add that if this triangle inequality fails, so it means we can see the same similarity which is not a distance metric by this definition, then it was recently proved that clustering algorithms, k means and db scan, might produce simply predetermined results. So they are not trustworthy for similarities that do not satisfy the metric axioms. Uh, and if we stop at the, at the previous two conditions, completeness and continuity, they are already quite strong. Nonetheless, there is a trivial mathematical solution to this problem because we could consider a very simple complete invariant uh, consisting of all rigid images. So imagine we have a point cloud and then we add to this image all, all other rigid images. So an infinite collection of all rigid images. So formally speaking, this is a complete invariant because it contains everything, but of course it's not practical. And more seriously, we could consider uh, distance matrices uh, on all uh, permutations of given point. So this is a finite invariant, but again, in practical, it was m factorial uh, permutations, they grow exponentially. So that's why we need two extra conditions. Um, computability means that uh, for fifth dimension, we would like an invariant computable in polynomial time in the size of the input, which is in our case, uh, the number of points. And the, sec uh, the final condition here, I stated uh, a bit informally. So we'd like to have a geographic style map, meaning that uh, we would like to have not only complete continuous uh, quickly computable invariant, but we also would like to know what invariants are possible. So what invariants actually realizable by, by real objects, uh, such, as, such as molecules. So that we can take a new realizable value and construct our real object from that. Uh, so for example, uh, yeah, it might be easy if I illustrate when it works and when it doesn't work. So this problem now with all these conditions, you think uh, it will solve in some partial cases. 
I'd like to have a complete invariant, uh, which is continuous, computable, and also uh, realizability. So what we would like uh, to see a map, geographic style map with all realizable invariants. So I hope from school joining team, you might remember this theorem. Theorem about triangles. So when we consider only three points, two triangles are congruent, or in our language isometric, if and only if we call the same triple of interpoint distances, ABC. Of course, we should be considered up to six um, permutations. And if we do not allow a mirror um, reflections to dis uh, distinguish mirror images when we allow only three cyclic permutations. But for simplicity, if you consider isometry, then the problem has been solved because we can actually draw that map. So we have three distances, ABC. Of course, they cannot be arbitrary, they should be positive, right? And also, since the order is not important, we can write one in increasing order for simplicity. So A less one B less one A equal to C. And also, there is only one extra condition on these distances. The triangle inequality as in, um, in the definition of a distance method. So if you have uh, now these three uh, inequalities, they define a subspace in the three-dimensional space, a triangular cone. So on this coordinate axis, A, B, C, uh, with uh, inequalities define a triangular cone, which I have shown uh, by a yellow section. So if in addition to isometry, we uh, consider compositions with uniform scaling, then our space of all possible triangles becomes very simple, so it becomes this yellow, yellow triangle in the middle. And uh, on this diagonal line, when A equals B equals C, we have all equilateral triangles, right? And on the boundaries, we have isosceles triangles, so actually two types. So one, one is a bit vertical, another one is a bit more horizontal. And on the uh, final um, boundary here, shown by this dashed line, we have a um, degenerate case when three points are in the straight line. But what's, what's an ideal solution we are looking for uh, in any general case? So we'd like to have a geographic style map like that. So that any location, by, so by choosing any new location in this triangle or including uniform scaling in this yellow space, we can reconstruct uh, a real object in that particular case triangle. So for triangles, that's an ideal solution known for more than 2,000 years, I guess. Uh, but how about a slightly more complicated case of four points? So quadrilaterals. Here I usually mention that geometric deep learning is uh, an area in machine learning that actually tries experimentally to solve the same, well, essentially the same problem. So output isometry invariance but unfortunately, yeah, without proofs of completeness and continuity. And uh, let me again uh, give this uh, basic example, which is very well known, uh, at least in crystallography and yes, also in chemistry. So a counter example to the naive extension of the SSS pair. So if you would like to consider similarly all interpoint distances and for four points, we now have six distances. When these six distances are almost enough. So Putin and Kemper 20 years ago almost solved the problem. So in general position, it is indeed a complete invariant. But unfortunately, there are counterexamples. So in this particular case, for uh, two quadrilaterals, four points, and uh, the same sets of six square wide distances. Do you think this is the only counterexample for four points? Mm -hmm. Have you seen Alex? I actually learned about other counterexamples only about one and a half years ago. I am still amazed because there are infinitely many of them. Not only infinitely many, there are so this is a family uh, of pairs of uh, clouds on four points depending on four free parameters. So A, B, C, D here uh, could be any positive numbers. So you vary these positive numbers, and then, then you construct two clouds. So three green points plus one orange point, and three green points plus one blue point. These two clouds have the same six pairwise distances. 
So what does it mean? It means that we have a huge family, uh, a four-dimensional family of pairs in, in the space of all quadrilaterals. And this family is only called dimension one. So dimension one means that uh, our space of all um, clouds of four points is, is five-dimensional because why five dimensional because we have six distances mm -hmm. and in general position they determine our point cloud but with six distances cannot be arbitrary they apart from triangular inequalities of course they should also satisfy one polynomial equation saying that uh, the volume of a tetrahedron on these four points is zero because our points are in the plane and this polynomial equation implies that um, we have only five degrees of freedom so roughly speaking the space is Five dimensional, and if you go only to a co dimension one subspace, uh, as here, we, we immediately get uh, counter examples. So uh, that's why this example also uh, um, motivated us to construct strong environments. So Yuri introduced it uh, in terms of graphs when we consider only vertices. Uh, in, when we have uh, additional information such as edges, we could use this edge information to uh, write not only distances but signs. But without any edges, uh, the point with distance distribution is even simpler. So for the top left vertex here, we write down distances to neighbors in increasing order. So for the top left, we write root 2, 2, and root 10. So this is the first row in the matrix right? in increasing order. Then we take another uh, point, top right vertex, and due to symmetry, it has the same distances to neighbors. So that's why it is convenient to collapse these two identical rows into one and assign the weight one half. So one half means that two of four points have the same distances to neighbors. So this uh, isosceles um, trapezium has two rows. Two rows and the extra column at the beginning uh, uh, shows weights. So here the uh, columns are naturally ordered, so by index indices of neighbors, but uh, rows are considered unordered. So you remember that our initial points are not ordered, so rows are also not ordered. Only for simplicity, we write them, say, in lexicographic order, but not for comparisons. So the kite example has a different uh, PDD matrix. As you can see, we have three rows, so the invariant became stronger stronger than all uh, interpoint distances because we have split them by, by point. And uh, the completeness and general position for PDD is actually almost obvious. If all distances here are distinct, then we simply uh, can reconstruct from this PDD matrix the classical distance matrix. So a distinct value of every distance uh, um, gives us information how to connect points. We can uh, reconstruct indices, <clears throat> the full uh, distance matrix, and the result of a full point cloud and isometry. So do you think PDD is a complete invariant? It's a strong invariant when all interpoint distances. And um, yeah, let me first uh, yeah, briefly mention that it is continuous. So although, Although under perturbation, uh, our say rows, our distances can become different and and distinct, so no collapsing. Nonetheless, we can compare them uh, continuously. So this is an, a picture illustrating actually the more complicated periodic case, uh, which will be discussed by Dan in more details. But roughly speaking, what happens here uh, if you have a square lattice and um, taking only four distances to nearest neighbors, when our PDD is one row of four values, one, 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 one. And if we uh, make a small perturbation, then the matrix uh, can become larger, so with two rows. But nonetheless, <laughs> there is a way to compare them continuously. So roughly speaking, we transform rows of one matrix into rows of another matrix through um, an optimal transfer pairing, so minimizing the cost of this matching. In that particular case, it's rather obvious that we should split one row into two halves and compare the first half to the first row, the second half to the second row. And since distances in the rows changed only a little bit, then uh, the weighted average of these changes 
will be also small, so we formally proved that if we shift every atom up to epsilon, then uh, PDD changes up to two epsilon only. And this is easy uh, to see uh, for two points. So if you shift each of <coughs> n points by epsilon, then the distance between them changes up to two epsilon only. So that's exactly uh, why you have the Lipschitz constant too. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, again, the okay, question of completeness. This is our conjecture that PDD is complete for clouds in the plane. So in the plane, we have distinguished all uh, known counterexamples. Uh, we don't have a proof of completeness uh, in the plane, but we know that uh, we um, other people actually found counterexamples previously of uh, uh, in, so examples of incompleteness, incompleteness uh, for PDD in a three-dimensional space. So roughly speaking, in all three dimensions, we have many more space to put points around each other and get equal distances. However, these uh, past counterexamples motivated us and actually helped us to construct even strong invariants. Uh, strong invariants that uh, are now proved to be complete. So let me... Um, let me only uh, well, briefly mention the idea. So point-wise distance distribution was uh, based on points. So you have a fixed point, and then we write distances to neighbors from a fixed point. So the natural extension of this idea is to fix not one point, but two points. So you fix two base points, and then write down distances to neighbors for a pair. So for any other point, we have two distances to two base points instead of one. So uh, one uh, simplification here is uh, in the Euclidean case. So actually, uh, so far, we could consider lots of points in any metric space, even below the Euclidean structure. But in the Euclidean case, there is a simplification because we can shift our point cloud so that the center of mass coincides with the origin. So the center of mass uh, acts as a, as a natural anchor. So one anchor is center of mass, but up after that, we, we need to consider really a, a base point from our point cloud. So, uh, so we could, uh, we briefly speaking, construct with pairs of distances to two anchors, for example, center of point, point, center of mass, and another base point. And these distances, so how do we uh, actually determine our, our point cloud? Uh, if, if you have such distribution of distances, then in the plane, uh, so imagine what happens. You have uh, two fixed points and the location of any other point is almost uniquely determined by these two distances. Only uh, you have ambiguity with respect to reflection here. So that's why in addition to these two distances, uh, our invariant includes, um, so, in the, uh, so this is a general metric case, let me skip it. Uh, but show you uh, counterexamples in three dimensions. So they look a little bit complicated, but can, it consists of only six points here. So six points on the left, six points on the right. And they, uh, again, uh, almost coincide with each other. These two clouds differ only by one point. This point, orange point, is the origin. So here we have a projection to the plane. And two point clouds um, t plus t minus they differ only you see by by a single coordinate in this point O. So on the left it is below the horizontal axis, on the right it is uh, above the horizontal axis. And uh, extra edges here actually not edges I, I highlighted distances that are equal equal distances and uh, these distances L one L two L three here can be considered uh, as actually three parameters. So that's why it's not a single example, it's an infinite family of examples uh, which cannot be distinguished by PDD. So even by the strong invariant, but we managed to distinguish it with this um, called it simplex wise distance distribution. So when we use two base points instead of one, then that strong invariant distinguish them. Uh, and we managed to do it even through manual computation. So no numerical uh, experiments involved, we, we did it manually for all infinitely many uh, 
uh, pairs of this you know, hard to distinguish concepts. So, um, so the key idea of simplex y center distribution is to have one fixed center, center of mass at origin, and then choose extra base points. Right. So I'll, I'll probably skip uh, skip the technical details uh, in the interest of time, but uh, show one simple example. So if our, our point cloud comes from a square, so arranged here in a diagonal way, then uh, there is um, <coughs> But our invariant is actually rather simple. So because of that extra symmetry, the distribution of, uh, of pairs um, of, of um, point-based representations that we construct, they're all the same. So the final invariant is actually what looks like what? So here, uh, this number one uh, means the distance from the center of mass to a point. So it's exactly the same distance one to all points. And this matrix, uh, contains pairs of distances to the center of mass and to a base point. So that's why you have here, <clears throat> have here three, uh, three pairs of distances plus with extra signs, minus and pluses, to distinguish mirror images for reconstruction. So one, uh, one in important actually um, uh, comment, uh, we have signs which can change discontinuously. When our triangle degenerates to um, a position of three points in a line, when sign changes discontinuously, and this was probably the hardest obstacle to resolve. And uh, the key ingredient to uh, get a Lipschitz continuous environment was a new concept uh, which we called the strength of a simplex. So the strength of, of a simplex, um, probably it's easier to give the formula simply for, for the triangle, is uh, the following um, expression. So if you know Heron's formula from school, geometry, so how the area of a triangle is expressed in terms of three interpoint distances, ABC, and half perimeter P, then uh, this is our suggestion for the strength of a simplex. So it's this product divided by P squared, which is roughly, roughly speaking, a linear function. So more exactly, uh, it changes linearly, almost linearly under perturbation, while the area of a triangle is a quadratic function. So it has quadratic units, but uh, with strength is linear and that's why we managed to prove Lipschitz continuity. So we simply multiply this discontinuous signs by that strength. So when our triangle degenerates so the strength goes to zero. So roughly speaking, it shows how non, how generic a triangle is. And similarly, actually, in any high dimension for an arbitrary simplex. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip with technical details, but only highlight that uh, the invariant is complete on the rigid motion. Lipschitz continues with a very simple constant too, and has a metric also computable in polynomial time. Right now, uh, let me show let me uh, show some uh, geographic style maps uh, again for simple cases of four points. For three points, uh, you have seen it was accessible probably even to Euclid, so he could have drawn it say on sun. But for four points, uh, again at school we learn uh, well different types of quadrilata: squares, rectangles, rhomboid, parallelograms, but in a discrete way, right? So they are arranged so usually in, in, in a discrete tree. However, remember the space of uh, point clouds and quadrilaterals, it is continuous. So this is a very rough simplification of a continuous space. So the space has dimension five uh, for four points in the plane. But if we add uniform scaling, then dimension um, goes down to four. So it becomes a bit simpler, a bit more manageable. So in this uh, cloud, so CSS here, cloud similarity space. We, uh, I could show you well how it works uh, again, starting from simple example for three points. So as you remember, our first action is to move the center of mass to the origin, and then uh, we could choose uh, the point which is most distant from the center uh, of mass. If we uh, rotate this point to a standard position, say in the positive x-axis, so if P1 is fixed, then the shape of a triangle is uniquely determined after that by the position of uh, 
only one more point, P2, because the center of mass will tell us where to put a uh, remaining point, P3. So point P2 here could be only in this yellow region. But uh, in this yellow region, we uh, necessarily need some identifications on the boundary. For example, uh, if you put P2 here, we have an equilateral triangle. And symmetrically, uh, this point uh, also gives an equilateral triangle, the same triangle. So this uh, yellow space should uh, have uh, identifications on the boundary if you can see the, um, if you do not include uh, reflection, so if you distinguish mirror images. And that's why the space actually becomes, uh, becomes a sphere. Yeah, a logical sphere. So this is the case of three points, but very similarly, it works for, uh, for four points. So then a simpler version when we consider all parallelograms. So in that case, so our parallelogram is a centrally symmetric uh, quadrilateral, the center of mass of origin, P1 in the positive x-axis, and after that, it's in, well, when P3, the opposite point will be at the opposite location in the x-axis, and after that, only uh, point P2 determines the shape of our parallelogram. So if we choose P2 on that <coughs> boundary arc, then we have a rectangle, and if our point P2 is on the vertical axis, then we have a rhombus. But the whole yellow interior shows uh, the modular space, the space of rigid classes of all parallelograms. Any questions? So I should uh, finish soon and uh, leave some time for questions, but uh, let me show the the, the vision for four points and uh, similar constructions works in um, hide uh, for for uh, larger clouds. So squares, so simplest uh, clouds of four points, squares, they de determined by one parameter, right? So the size, simply the side length of a square. But then these um, squares are included into two different families, rectangles and thromba, all right? Uh, which now um, form continuous spaces parameterized by two mean values. If, uh, if you extend it further to uh, parallelograms at, at the same level, so in three parameters, we have heights and isosceles trape uh, trapeziums or trapezoids. And for four parameters, the construction of our invariants allows to naturally define subclasses, which we call isoradial quotes. So it simply means but uh, from the center of mass, we have two equal distances to uh, um, two most distant uh, points. Or mediagonal quotes when the diagonal is split exactly uh, in, in half by, um, by the intersection of two diagonals. So that's how with five-dimensional space of quadrilaterals will look later. So I've shown you so far uh, only simpler, simpler projections in the case of um, of parallelograms. So what is important here, that we, we, uh, all, um, all restrictions on these invariant values are now only in terms of inequalities. So there are no equations involved. For distances, we need an equation. For example, six distances uh, between four points should satisfy uh, rather complicated polynomial equation saying that the tetrahedron is flat, so the volume is zero. But uh, these invariants do not have uh, equations, only inequalities. So it means that we can sample our space yeah, with 100% success. So there are only identifications on the boundary, but apart from these identifications, uh, nothing else. So we could sample space and get our uh, rigid class of a point cloud uh, immediately from that. So to summarize, uh, Yes, uh, sorted radial vector, of course, makes sense for a point cloud as an Uri stock. Then uh, we have strong gain variant, uh, all sorted distances, which is complete in general position, but not for all cases. PDD, point wise distance distribution, is even stronger, but asymptotically has the same time. And the complete invariant, for example, for clouds in three dimensions, is uh, simplex wise center distribution. So we applied uh, to QM9 database, not only uh, invariants 
for graphs, but also for point clouds. So especially because Q9 uh, lists on the atomic coordinates even without covalent bonds. And uh, we have managed to distinguish all of them. Uh, so here I show you a, a different projection. So again, the same free energy, but on a different color bar. Yeah, two simple invariants, so expressed in terms of interpoint distances, so a different projection. But the important conclusion what we have made here, we compare all uh, molecules as pure atomic clouds without considering uh, atomic, uh, atomic types. So there were no chemical elements involved. And we have managed to distinguish all of them. What does this mean? So different molecules differ as rigid clouds of points. So that's why uh, we stated as uh, a principle of molecular rigidity. We do not lose information if you consider only atomic geometry and with atomic coordinates are known precisely enough. So in principle, we could reconstruct chemical elements from uh, atomic geometry if it is known with high enough precision. And this also allows us to formally define a molecular structure as a rigid class of only atomic clouds of modular rigid motion. So formally, uh, this definition well can be, uh, could have been given even earlier, but our complete invariants make this definition practical because we can distinguish now rigid classes of all atomic clouds and, and, and reconstruct that molecule. Uh, under each motion. Right. Uh, so let me let me let me skip with the dimensionality reduction and show uh, show a vision. Yeah, I should finish with in a minute. So structure property relationship is an important problem for for many uh, applied areas, uh, of course, for chemistry and um, material science. We have focused in our research on the concept of a structure. So how to define the rigid structure exactly? But after we have rigorously defined this concept of structure, now we can help and predict useful properties because uh, these properties can be visualized on that modular spaces or geographic style maps as uh, in the form of mountainous landscapes because we have a one-to-one -one invertible uh, map between abstract structures and very specific uh, invariants um, on that space. So the next talk by uh, Dave will be about uh, direction for chemistry. So, so it's very natural that we have a geographic style map and you are given chemistry a direction. So I think we should simply collaborate <laughs> because maps with directions, let's drive, to, drive together. <laughs> so, thank you. I'll stop recording. And I know why.